Well, Saints, it's wonderful that you could join me here today in celebrating the fourth Sunday of Pentecost. Before we get started, I hope you have our pew sheet that uh, we are going to be using today. And I hope that you also have your Bibles with you so that we can, uh, you can read along with me as, um, and our readers as we read from our Bible. Well, we're going to actually start by singing an opening hymn, which is, We Have Come Into This House. Now, there are a small group of saints gathered with me today, um, but I hope that you have uh, got a sense of us gathering together as you watch from your home. Well, let's start as we sing, We Have Come To His House. to meet with God and to take our part in the building up of his church. We will lift up our hearts in thanks and praise. We'll hear from God's holy word and we'll pray for this world and for ourselves. The scriptures say, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, let us pray together the prayer of approach. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, during the season of Pentecost, we say the Gloria, and I invite you to say with me this amazing hymn. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, 
with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. O oh God, your son, your son has taught us that those who give a cup of water in his name will not lose their reward. Open our hearts to the needs of your children and in all things make us obedient to your will so that in faith we may receive your gracious gift, eternal life, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now let us prepare for the ministry of the word. Heavenly Father, give us wisdom and understanding as we listen to your word. May we know you better, love you more, and learn to please you in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm now going to welcome up our readers. The first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. Abraham tested. Some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place where God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him upon the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The psalm is Psalm 13, a psalm of David. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day observe them in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love my heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. The second reading comes from the letter written by the Apostle Paul to the Church of Rome, chapter 6, verses 12 to 23. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who are brought from death to life, 
and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey him from your heart, the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and become slaves to righteousness. I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the controls of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have become set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew chapter 10 beginning at verse 40. Glory to you Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, today our lectionary calendar leads us to one of the most perplexing and heart-wrenching passages in the whole Bible. And I'm very willing to admit that I was tempted to skip over this passage because in only 12 minutes to preach, it's very hard to do this passage justice. However, today's Genesis passage provides a model for which Paul also delves into in the second half of his letter to the uh, believers at Rome in chapter 6. And so as I gave attention last week to our freedom from slavery to sin, I decided to delve into this complex and controversial passage because it's teaching much the same lesson that Paul was teaching. Well, I'm vividly aware that you are are very familiar with this controversial passage. Right from the beginning, we are confronted with God asking Abraham, a loving father, to do a somewhat what we would think unethical or even unjust request to sacrifice his beloved son. And this dilemma has led many critics to dismiss the story on the grounds that it presents a grotesque caricature of the God of the Bible. But before we give into this temptation to stand in judgment into the very heart and mind of God, let us enter into the story not with an attitude that balks at God's horrific request, but rather with a heart that, stands to, uh, that seeks to understand how this difficult passage even challenges us today. Although it is extremely unlikely that God would ever ask us to do such a thing as what he asked Abraham, God does indeed often ask us to lay down the things that we truly love 
trusting us to step out in faith in his ability to bring to pass his plan and purpose in our lives. So let's turn to that passage in Genesis. Some years after Abraham and Sarah had given birth to their miracle son Isaac, Abraham heard the voice of God again. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you about. Well, it could have been enough if God had simply said, take your son, but he qualified the phrase in three ways. He said, your only son, remembering that Ishmael was also Abraham's son, but God identified that Isaac was the son through whom his promise would come. Isaac was the son whom Abraham and Sarah had waited for 25 long years. And he said, whom you love. Though it, it kind of seems as though God is mocking Abraham, these words were meant to reassure Abraham that God knew what he was asking. And by saying it this way, Abraham would know that God understood how much this cost him. After hearing God's command, Abraham really had only two options. Either he obeys or he disobeys. There's no way around it. The truth is, God asked Abraham to put his own son to death. And Abraham agreed to do it. Let's read in verse 3. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance, and he said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Even at this early point, Abraham's response to God's command is exemplary. First, Abraham's obedience was immediate. Second, Abraham's obedience was unquestioning. And third, Abraham's obedience was filled with faith in the goodness of God. Nestled in Abraham's comment to his servant is the very faith-filled statement that we're actually looking for. We will worship and then we will come back. Hang on. Nowhere had God promised to spare his son. Yet somehow Abraham understood enough of God's character that he was willing to do what God required in the faith that somehow God would work out the details and spare his son. As Abraham and Isaac proceeded up their climb up the mountain, Isaac realised that they were not carrying a lamb. And so Abraham answered him, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Across the centuries, Christians have seen in these words a prefiguring of the death of Christ on the cross. There is Abraham representing God, placing the wood representing the cross upon Isaac, representing Jesus Christ. It's the father offering his son freely in painful sacrificial love, just as God the father offered Jesus, his beloved son, for the sins of the whole world. Somehow, Abraham understood something of the doctrine of substitutionary atonement when he said, 
God himself will provide the lamb. He was not only pointing towards the altar on Mount Moriah, but to a greater sacrifice to be offered at the exact same location 2,000 years in the future when God would provide the ultimate sacrificial lamb, Jesus Christ, for the sin of the whole world. As soon as they reached the place where God had appointed, Abraham prepared an altar and reached for the knife that would slay his only son. It is at this point that we see Abraham's faith at its highest and at its best. Even though the command made no sense to any human point of view, Abraham intended to obey it anyway. Looking back on this incident some 20 centuries later, the writer of Hebrews explains it in this way. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offering will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. That's from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 and 19. Abraham was prepared to kill his own son to obey God's command, even though it meant killing God's promise. How could a man do such a thing? Because he believed that God could raise the dead. Just as Abraham was about to obey God's horrific command, the Lord stopped him. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Did Abraham know in advance how the story would end? No. We read just at that moment God provided the lamb to be the sacrifice. Did Abraham know that God was going to provide the sacrifice? By faith, yes, he did. But that's not all that Abraham knew. He knew that God had promised to give him a son through whom he was going to bless the world. What he didn't know was how God was going to reconcile both his promise to bless the world through Isaac and his command to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. Yet Abraham demonstrated that to God that he was willing to not even allow his love for his son to stand in the way of his obedience to God. Now Paul rem reminds the believers in Rome that there is a good reason to regard Abraham as our spiritual father to all who believe. And you can read about that in Romans chapter 4. Well, how do we apply this difficult passage into our lives? Why did God make such an outrageous request to a loving father? We could surmise perhaps that Isaac had become too important to Abraham. Perhaps this promised child had begun to take God's place in Abraham's thinking or in his heart. We have no way to know whether these suggestions are true or not, but we are intimately aware that it is extremely easy for things that we love or people that we love to become so important to us and they begin to take God's place on the throne of our own heart. God does indeed orchestrate the affairs of our life, both the good and the bad, to bring us to a place 
where our faith will be tested. At these times, we will be asked to decide who are we allowing to sit on the throne in our heart. When something or someone takes the place of being loved more than God, it has become an idol. When something or someone promises to provide us with meaning or worth, but also threatens that if we do not serve them, our lives will become worthless, meaningless and empty, it has become an idol in our heart. Idols of the heart can take many forms. They are things that we say we can't live without. Heart idols usually come under four main headings. Power, approval, security and comfort. Let me leave you with four questions. They're trigger questions to assist you to delve deeper into discerning what idols may have attempted to, to start growing in your heart. Do you love control, influence, admire strength and like to be the person who has the last word? There may be an idol of power growing inside. Do you try to hide your weaknesses from others? Tend to be overbearing and impatient with others. You may have a security idol developing. Are you overly concerned with what others think of you and crave recognition and praise to give you meaning and acceptance? This could be an indication that an approval idol is present. Lastly, if you are constantly working hard to create a comfortable life and are fearful of anything that could jeopardise your life of pleasure, it could be that an idol of comfort has taken root. Well, you are the only one who can discern if something or someone is attempting to sit as an idol on the throne of your heart. But our response should be the same. Paul writes in chapter 6, Do not let sin control the way you live. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. Use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Let us all make a commitment to not allow anything to stand in the place before the love that we have for God. And let us ensure that God alone sits on the throne of our heart. Let's pray. Father God, it is a challenge indeed to us to confront those areas of our life where we may have allowed an idol to develop. As we meditate on the discussion questions and the further information in the message transcript, may we delve deeper into being open to be challenged on what idols may have begun to grow in our heart and may we be open to repent and ask for your forgiveness for that. In the name of Jesus, our loving Saviour, who promises to forgive us. Amen. Well, saints, let us stand to affirm the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and a seat hand at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O oh God, 
O oh God, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to suffer death upon a cross, and by his glorious resurrection delivered us from the power of the enemy, grant us so as to die daily to sin that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his resurrection through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We're now going to pray for the world and for the church. The refrain today, when I say, Gracious God in your mercy, is hear our prayer. I just pause because I want to know, would anyone else like to lead this prayer or would you like me to lead the prayer? It's up to you. No, you'd like me to? Just give me a second. Um, Let us pray for the world and for the church. Gracious God in your mercy, and our response is, hear our prayer. We pray for the nations of the world, for an end to war and for peaceable solutions to conflict, for wise government and for a just sharing of the resources of the earth. Hear our prayers for those who are tortured or held in prison, for those taken from their families and land, for your little ones who are dying of hunger and thirst. Show us your face in these your children and, let us, and help us to minister to them as we would minister to you. God of grace, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your church, for visionary leadership and for faithful discipleship, for unity between Christians, for the mission of the church throughout the world. Hear our prayers for all who are ministers of your gospel, for all who unsettle us with your words of truth, for your little ones who are crying out for words of forgiveness and grace. Show us your face in these your children and help us to listen to them as we would listen to you. God of grace, in your mercy, hear yeah, our prayer. prayer. We pray for our community, for loving nurture of children and care for the vulnerable for respect for individuals and concern for their well-being of all. Hear our prayers for those who are strangers or newcomers here. We think particularly for our many emergency relief clients, for those who are homeless, destitute or without work, for your little ones who are hurting from rejection and abuse. Show us your face in these, your children, and help us to pray as we would welcome you. God of grace, in your mercy, hear yeah, our prayer. Yeah. We pray for all who are in need or distress, for comfort for the grieving and for hope for the despairing, for companionship for the lonely and relief for those in pain. Hear our prayers for those who are shut away from society, the disabled and the frail, for those who long for a comforting touch or a kindly word for your little ones who are starved of love and affection. Show us your face in these children and help us to care for them as we would care for you. God of grace in your mercy, hear yeah, our prayer. Yeah. This week we pray specifically to the, for those in our community who are sick, for Heather Goodwin, for Pauline Robertson, for Bob Ison, Monica Barr, for um, Bill Durley, for Bev Watson, for Judy Ann and Ray Stevens, and for Robert Southcombe. We pray for God's healing and comfort at this time. We also pray for Jenny Dacom and Dawn Tulk as they continue to grieve the loss of their loved ones. We give you thanks for the lives for all who have died in the faith, for all good and holy people who have recognised you in their midst. Show us your face and let us hear your voice, that we may welcome you into our lives, and with all your saints, receive from you the gift of everlasting life. God of grace, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that what we have asked in faith, we may by your grace receive. Amen. 
we conclude by praying as our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're now going to have a time of sharing how God has been working in our lives. For those of you who are watching me, those may have come through email or through text or through telephone call to me sometime during the week. I'm also going to invite our saints here if they would like to share a word of what God's doing in their lives. excited to share it with you and I hope that you will share it with others through the telephone at this time. We are the body of Christ. His spirit is with us. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Take this time to call someone and give them the peace of the Lord and also ask them if there's anything that you can pray for or how they're going and whether there's anything that you can encourage them with. It's really important at this time that we stay in touch with everyone particularly those who are unable to come to the, our church services. So please go ahead and pause the video and do that now. Well, saints, let us prepare together to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we come to receive the Holy Communion of the body and the blood of our Saviour Christ, who came only because of his great love for us. For although we were completely undeserving of his love, yet in order to raise us from the darkness of death to everlasting life as God's sons and daughters, our Saviour Christ humbled himself to share our life and to die for us on the cross. In remembrance of his death and as a pledge of his love, Jesus instituted this holy sacrifice, which we are now going to share. But those who would eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord must examine themselves and amend their lives. They must come with a penitent heart and steadfast faith. Above all, they must give thanks to God for his love toward us in Christ Jesus. Well, knowing the goodness of God and the times that we fail to respond with love and obedience, let us confess <clears throat> our sins together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, the Lord be with you. And also Lift you. up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. All glory and honour be yours everywhere and always, mighty Creator, ever living God. We give you thanks and praise for our Saviour Jesus Christ, who by the power of your Spirit 
was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, and we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let us say together, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. <coughs> Therefore we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once and for all upon the cross, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup, his own perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit and unite us in the body of your Son and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom the fellowship of the Holy Spirit we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power are yours for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. Come and let us take this holy sacrament of the body and the blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us and we will feed on him by faith in our hearts with thanksgiving. We will share the bread now with those of us who are gathered in the church.
of salvation. We all participate in drinking the cup of salvation as we remember Christ's death and resurrection. Today I drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for me and we do so until he returns. Amen. Gracious God, thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and the blood of our Saviour Jesus Christ. Thank you for assuring us of your goodness and love and that we are living members of Christ's body. Let's say together, Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Well, for those of you who are at home, I pray that you remain in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. But I also pray that as you go about your week, you'll continue to delve deeper in asking yourself, is Christ, is God at the forefront and on the throne of my heart? And why don't you get in touch with other people within our fellowship and show them the joy that comes from having Jesus in your life. Amen. Amen. We're now going to close in uh, singing together and please if you're at home sing heartily the final hymn you shall go out with joy. <laughs>